total shoulder replacement with intact bone and soft tissue. An exceptional video dedicated to teaching total shoulder arthroplasty. This video contains fantastic figures cartooned photos and more surprises in a side. Total shoulder replacement with intact bone and soft tissue. The success of orthopedic surgery. Many thanks to the authors. Craig Edward v. Elizabeth Dempsey. Joel Herring and Robert Warren Williams. This video was created based on the findings from the book cited below. Craig Edward v. Elizabeth Dempsey, Joel Herring, and Robert Warren Williams. Master Techniques in Orthopedic Surgery The Shoulder. Lippincott Williams and Wilkins, 2004. The patient is positioned in the beach chair position with the affected arm supported on an armrest that may be moved in and out of the operating field. For work on the humeral head, cuff, and glenoid, the arm is best supported on the arm rest. For shoulder arthroplasty, insertion of a glenoid component requires excellent exposure. There are many steps that aid in exposure, and these steps include everything from patient positioning to proper retractor placement. The important factors in glenoid exposure include the following. Complete muscle relaxation, often with general anesthesia. The arm prepped completely free and scapula stabilized. Complete release of subdeltoid, subacromial, and subpectoral adhesions. Complete release of subscapularis muscle. Complete excision of humeral head osteophytes. Complete humeral head excision. Complete anterior and, when necessary, inferior capsular release. Retractor placements that maximizes visualization posteriorly, superiorly, and anteriorly. The skin incision is deltopectoral, originating at the inferior border of the clavicle, halfway between the acromioclavicular joint and the coracoid process, and extending inferiorly and laterally to the deltoid insertion, ending just lateral to the muscle belly of the biceps. The skin and subcutaneous tissue are divided to the level of the deltoid. The deltopectoral interval is then identified, usually by the cephalic vein, which has fat overlying it, particularly a fat triangle at the level of coracoid process, figure. If there is difficulty identifying the deltopectoral interval, external rotation of the humerus puts the pectoralis under some tension and makes the superior fibers of the pectoralis more easily identifiable. In addition, the interval may be found in the superior aspect of the wound at the level of the coracoid process. Although the cephalic vein may be able to be preserved, it may also be ligated and excised to ensure against intraoperative avulsion. The clavipectoral fascia adjacent to the conjoined tendon is identified and incised up to the level of the coracoacromial ligament. Often, there are significant muscle fibers of the brachialis and short head of the biceps which extends somewhat laterally to the tendinous portion of the conjoined tendon. These should be included with the conjoined tendon and retracted medially, the underlying bursa and subscapularis are then exposed, figure. Electrocauterization can be used to handle the branch of the thoracoacromial trunk, a troublesome bleeder in the superior aspect of the wound. The coracoacromial ligament may also be excised, figure. If necessary for exposure, the upper one-fourth of pectoralis tendon may be divided and the deltoid insertion along the lateral aspect of the humerus may be divided or elevated subperiosteally. This release of the deltoid distally makes it less likely that the deltoid muscle will be significantly traumatized during retraction. Care should be taken to completely free adhesions from under the deltoid, in the subacromial space, and under both pectoralis major and conjoined tendon. Retractors such as Richardson, Brown, or any one of a number of self-retaining retractors beneath both deltoid and conjoined tendon clarify the position and anatomy of the rotator cuff. At this point, the amount of passive external rotation may be tested with the arm at the side. In some patients, internal rotation contracture may severely limit external rotation. In this situation, a Z-lengthening of the subscapularis is necessary to provide external rotation. If, however, passive external rotation is 10 degrees or greater from the neutral position, the lengthening of the subscapularis is not needed. The anterior humeral circumflex vessels are cauterized as the dissection continues.
the subscapularis and anterior capsula are then divided together from the level of the rotator interval to the most inferior border of the subscapularis insertion figure. These are divided approximately 2 cm from the lesser tuberosity insertion of the subscapularis. Care must be taken when dividing the subscapularis inferiorly so that the axillary nerve is not inadvertently injured. The axillary nerve crosses beneath the subscapularis tendon 3 mm medial to the musculotendinous junction. External rotation of the humerus, while the subscapularis is being divided, will minimize the likelihood that the axillary nerve will be inadvertently injured. In addition, a blunt retractor beneath the subscapularis also minimizes the potential for nerve injury. Care must be taken to divide the capsule as far inferiorly as possible. This not only helps in a tight shoulder to expose the joint for dislocation of the humeral head but also permits adequate humeral retraction posteriorly for glenoid exposure. With the subscapularis divided, the rotator interval is incised medially to the level of the coracoid process, and the subscapularis muscle is tagged with stay sutures and retracted medially. Figure. Release of the biceps tendon in the rotator improves exposure, gives a clearer identification of precise cuff attachment, and minimizes later biceps tendon problems. A decision can be made whether a simple tenotomy or later tenodesis is preferable. This choice is frequently surgeon specific. The humeral head is then dislocated by hyperextending and externally rotating the arm. It is often helpful to place a blunt retractor superiorly over the neck of the humerus, under the supraspinatus, and inferiorly under the neck of the humerus, inside the capsule. With dislocation of the humeral head and delivery into the wound, preparation is made for humeral head resection and osteotomy. Marginal osteophytes are removed. Figure. Patients with osteoarthritis often have intraarticular loose bodies, which should be removed. In addition, during inferior capsular division, in the presence of a large inferior osteophyte, the axillary nerve may be quite close to the inferior aspect of the humeral head and osteophyte, and caution should be used while dissecting in this area. The humeral head is then dislocated by hyperextending and externally rotating the arm. It is often helpful to place a blunt retractor superiorly over the neck of the humerus, under the supraspinatus, and inferiorly under the neck of the humerus, inside the capsule. With dislocation of the humeral head and delivery into the wound, preparation is made for humeral head resection and osteotomy. Marginal osteophytes are removed. Figure. Patients with osteoarthritis often have intraarticular loose bodies, which should be removed. In addition, during inferior capsular division, in the presence of a large inferior osteophyte, the axillary nerve may be quite close to the inferior aspect of the humeral head and osteophyte, and caution should be used while dissecting in this area. Exactly how the humeral head and neck osteotomy is performed depends on the total shoulder system being used. What follows is a description of the Biomet Comprehensive Primary Shoulder Arthroplasty System, a shoulder system in which reverse, fracture stem, and anatomic primary system are integrated. Whatever the shoulder system used, the osteotomy of the head of the humerus consists of only that portion of the head ordinarily covered with articular cartilage. The head is osteotomized in 30 degrees of retroversion, which mimics the normal amount of retroversion of the humerus. In addition, the osteotomy is at an angle of approximately 45 to 50 degrees to the shaft of the humerus, figure. If the osteotomy is to be made freehand, a trial prosthesis may be placed against the proximal humerus and the angle of the osteotomy outlined with a cautery, figure. With the elbow bent 90 degrees, the forearm in neutral rotation, the arm externally rotated 35 degrees, and the osteotomy angled directly from anterior to posterior, a retroversion cut of 30 degrees is produced. Determining the retroversion and humeral neck osteotomy. Alternatively, a humeral head resection guide may be used, and many shoulder arthroplasty systems have either an internal, intramedullary, or an external, extramedullary, guide, which helps the surgeon reproduce the neck shaft angle, retroversion degree, and height of humeral head cut corresponding to that recommended for the specific implant being inserted. In the comprehensive system, the resection guide is placed on the intramedullary T-handled reamer. 
A one quarter of an inch drill bit is used to make a pilot hole just posterior to the bicipital groove, approximately 1 to 1.5 centimeters from the greater tuberosity into the medullary canal of the humerus. Figure. The sequential T-handled reamers are then used to prepare the humerus to the point at which resistance, or chatter, is felt in the shaft of the humerus. Figure. The depth of the reamer is determined by whether one chooses to use a standard, mini, or micro stem length. The depth of the reamer is determined by whether one chooses to use a standard, mini, or micro stem length. In most instances, I prefer a mini stem. At this point, the humeral head resection guide is assembled directly onto the T-handled reamer. The humeral head resection guide ensures that the angle relative to the shaft of the humerus will be 45 to 50 degrees, figure. A retroversion guide rod inserted into the resection guide and kept parallel to the forearm ensures the appropriate amount of retroversion for the cut, figure. In this particular system, it is possible to make the cut in 20, 30, or 40 degrees of retroversion. The usual cut for primary osteoarthritis and osteonecrosis will be made in 30 degrees of retroversion. Less retroversion may be needed if there is a possibility of posterior instability of the implant. More retroversion may be needed in some cases of malunion following the fracture. When the humeral head resection guide is lined up appropriately, 1 8 inch drill bits are used to secure it to the shaft of the humerus, and the cutting block is used to make the appropriate angle cut and resect the appropriate amount of humerus, figure. In the Biomet comprehensive system, an angel wing inserted under the cuff and fit into the cutting block assists in determining the precise cut location. One pitfall at this part of the procedure is as follows. If too little humeral head is resected, there will be a ridge of bone remaining inside the joint, leading to tightness of the joint, incomplete seating of the humeral prosthesis, and difficulty in exposing the glenoid for the implantation of the glenoid component. Alternatively, if the resection of the humeral head is too extensive, the egress of the osteotomy may be either into the rotator cuff or even into the greater tuberosity, in which case fracture of the greater tuberosity results. The osteotomy cut should emerge precisely at the position where the rotator cuff inserts on the greater tuberosity, figure. No ridge should be able to be felt between the rotator cuff tenderness and capsular insertion and the free cut of the humeral head. The resected humeral head is then removed. In this shoulder system, it is usual for the humeral component to be implanted without cement. In order for this goal to be achieved, Precise preparation of the intramedullary humeral shaft is afforded by a series of brooches that correspond to the shape of the humeral stem and are graduated in diameter in increments. Once the intramedullary shaft has been hand reamed and the humeral head osteotomy performed, the broaching is begun with the brooch three sizes smaller than the last intramedullary reamer used. For example, if the intramedullary cutting guide has been assembled onto the size 12 reamer, the first size brooch utilized is a size 8 or 9. The brooch is attached to a handle that facilitates broaching and to which version rod is attached to ensure that the correct version can be maintained throughout utilization of progressively increasing sizes of brooches. The brooches are sequentially used until the fit is snug. It must be considered that in this system the final implant has a diameter one and half larger than the corresponding size brooch because of the surface coating. Therefore, judgment must be made regarding what is elected as the final brooch. A snug but not watertight fit of brooch seems to be adequate to make certain the implant will not be too tight at implantation and risk trauma to the humeral shaft. In general, the safety of a less tight fit is referable, as in most arthroplasty series, loosening of a press fit humeral component has not been a common problem. Once the osteotomy is complete and the progressively increasing size brooches have prepared the humerus, the final brooch may be left in prior to glenoid preparation. A small metal disc may be inserted into the brooch that protects the prepared proximal humerus from trauma by retractors during glenoid preparation. The brooch is seated fully in the intramedullary canal in the appropriate amount of version, figure. The following guides to the appropriate version of the humerus can be observed when the most lateral point of the brooch is placed just posterior, lateral, to the bicipital groove.
With the elbow at 90 degrees and the arm facing straight ahead, the humeral component should face directly toward the glenoid. When looking at the forearm and shoulder from above, the most lateral prominence of the stem should make an angle of 30 degrees with the transverse axis of the elbow. A version guide on the stem inserter, set at the desired version angle, should be aligned parallel with the forearm. With the humeral brooch seated securely on the osteotomy cut, any marginal peripheral osteophyte that extends past and overhangs the resected area may be removed. Figure. It is quite common for a peripheral osteophyte to be present both inferiorly and posteriorly in the primary osteoarthritis of the shoulder. The arm is then positioned for exposure of the glenoid. The extremity is resting on an arm board or bean bag, with or without rolled sheets to act as bolsters. Slight abduction and external rotation may facilitate exposure, but frequently arm position changes as access to different area of the glenoid is needed. A glenoid retractor, ring or fukuda, is placed around the posterior rim of the glenoid, and the proximal humerus is gently retracted. Figure. Exposure of the glenoid is critical for satisfactory insertion of a glenoid prosthesis. In most instances, whenever glenoid exposure is inadequate or the working space too tight, it is usually because of inadequate soft tissue release. To expose the glenoid, one makes certain that the anterior capsular attachment at the rim of the glenoid is released from superior to inferior, so that the entire neck of the glenoid can be palpated from superior to inferior, figure. This may be facilitated by developing the interval between the subscapularis and capsule. The subscapularis may then be retracted anteriorly, and the entire capsule released and resected. The axillary nerve should be palpated and consideration given to a blunt retractor inferiorly below the capsule to protect the axillary nerve while the capsule is released. Anterior and posterior glenoid labrum may be excised in their entirety and any proliferative synovium is removed as well. If the biceps has been divided, its attachment site at the superior glenoid may be excised. Figure. If necessary, the posterior capsule may be released from superior to inferior as well, though this is rarely necessary. Maintaining the posterior capsule may protect against posterior instability of the implant, particularly in long-standing osteoarthritis that may be associated with preoperative capsular stretching posteriorly. Although maintaining the most inferior capsular attachment from humerus to glenoid helps protect the axillary nerve coursing underneath the soft tissue capsular structure, if need be, a circumferential capsulotomy may be performed so that the humerus can be retracted. A blunt retractor, such as a forked glenoid or darach, is placed deep to the subscapularis and anterior capsule, exposing the anterior glenoid rim. A second blunt retractor, such as a darach, may be placed superior to the anatomic location of biceps tendon insertion, so that the deltoid can be retracted, exposing the most superior portion of the glenoid. If glenoid exposure is difficult, reviewing the steps that aid in exposure may be helpful, complete subdeltoid releases of the scar, complete humeral head resection, complete humeral osteophyte removal, and anterior and inferior capsular releases. Occasionally, residual inferior humeral osteophyte will protrude through the ring retractor on the posterior glenoid, interfering with glenoid exposure, preparation, and implantation of the glenoid component. This osteophyte becomes less prominent if the arm is brought into external rotation, but if the inferior aspect of the proximal humeral osteophyte is protruding through the ring retractor and interfering with exposure, it may be trimmed further. With the face of the glenoid exposed, any residual cartilage may be removed from the face of the glenoid, figure. It is important at this point to judge the wear pattern of the glenoid, to try to decide whether there is indeed osteophyte formation that distorts the exposed face of the glenoid, and to try to identify the center of the glenoid, under which is the cancellous neck. Careful review of X-ray or CT scan can help identify the glenoid center. A straight instrument or a gloved finger can palpate the anterior border of the glenoid neck and give the surgeon an idea of the angle of the glenoid neck, so a centering hole can be made. Total shoulder systems use a variety of glenoid fixation designs, keel, peg, anchor peg, and maybe all poly, metal back, or hybrid, 
poly and metal. Poly designs are intended for use with cement, while the glenoid currently designed with metal for ingrowth may be used without cement. The hybrid glenoid design has both poly pegs for immediate fixation with cement and a central metal post of porous metal intended for bone and growth. Precise preparation depends on the type of glenoid used and the specific implant used and will be design specific. While many designs work well, the comprehensive system, manufactured by Biomet, is the system I have co-designed and used most frequently. This glenoid has a radius of curvature that is slightly greater than the radius of curvature of the humeral head and uses pegs for fixation. There are three peripheral poly pegs and a central post that can either be all poly for compression fit or a porous metal for end growth. Under most circumstances, I use the hybrid glenoid with an all poly base with three pegs and a central porous metal post. Once the glenoid is exposed, a guide can be placed for sizing and to drill a hole in the center of the glenoid, where all subsequent glenoid preparation instruments will take their purchase. The center hole is drilled in the glenoid, figure. Following this, depending on the planned glenoid size, a small, medium, or large glenoid reamer, designed to fit into the center hole, is utilized to prepare the glenoid face. This matches the contour of the posterior aspect of the glenoid, figure. Excessive posterior or anterior wear of the glenoid, or excessive osteophyte formation, can cause the surgeon to create a center hole for the glenoid that is not exactly in the anatomic cancellous center of the glenoid, leading to cortical penetration or fracture of the glenoid during preparation. A small curette may be utilized to probe the center hole to be certain it is in line with the cancellous glenoid neck. Although there is usually little distortion of the anatomy in osteonecrosis, it is common for patients who have primary osteoarthritis of the shoulder to wear the glenoid more posteriorly than anteriorly and thus to have some posterior sloping of the glenoid. If this is not taken into consideration, the posterior half of the glenoid component may not seat securely on subchondral bone, resulting in a gap between posterior prosthesis and posterior glenoid. Thus, the surgeon has three options if there is excessive wear in the posterior half of the glenoid. Burr down the anterior half of the glenoid bone to match the extent of posterior wear. Bone grafts the posterior glenoid so that the implant seats securely on anterior and posterior bone. Use a glenoid component that already considers asymmetry of glenoid wear posterior built-up glenoid. The glenoid reamer can be directed to consider if asymmetric reaming is to be done to normalize the glenoid version. Under most circumstances, the high side anterior glenoid bone can be contoured so that the posterior glenoid does not need to be grafted. Once the glenoid face is prepared via reaming, an implant-specific series of instruments prepares the exposed glenoid for its method of fixation. In the comprehensive hybrid glenoid, a guide for the three peripheral pegs is inserted and these peg holes are drilled superiorly, anteriorly, and posteriorly. Guides are then utilized for drilling of the central peg holes, which are of Regenerex, a porous metal, or a polyethylene compression peg. These central pegs are designed to screw into the back of the hybrid glenoid base, and the surgeon can choose to use either figure. The appropriately sized glenoid trial component is inserted, figure. The appropriately sized glenoid trial component is inserted, figure. A slotted or clear glenoid trial can be used to make certain that both the anterior and posterior halves of the glenoid component seat securely on subchondral bone, figure. The preparation of the glenoid is completed when both anterior and posterior surfaces of the component seat on subchondral bone and there is no excessive rocking or toggle of the component. Three glenoid sizes are available in this system to match the exposed glenoid face. All have the same radius of curvature. All glenoids match all humeral head sizes. In those unusual circumstances in which it is elected to use bone graft, the resected humeral head can be used, a wedge-shaped piece of corticocancellous bone can be created, and one or two screws can secure bone graft in the posterior glenoid, figure. Once the glenoid preparation is complete, figure, the glenoid face and peg holes are meticulously dried, using either pulsating lavage or an eponephrine-soaked sponge.
The hybrid glenoid is assembled by screwing the central porous metal peg into the hybrid glenoid base. Methacrylate is pressurized into the three peripheral peg holes, and the glenoid component is tapped into place utilizing an instrument that fits precisely into its curvature, figure. If cortical penetration occurs during glenoid preparation, cancellous graft from the humeral head can be used to pack this defect prior to implantation of the glenoid component. If the disease process creates wear so far medial, in some cases even medial to the coracoid base, that there is not enough bone to support a glenoid component, the surgeon can consider a hemiarthroplasty alone or consider hemiarthroplasty using soft tissue interposition, such as a fascia latar, capsule Achilles allograft, or meniscus to cover the glenoid surface instead of a polyethylene glenoid component. Another option if there is not enough bone to support a component is the ream and run, in which the glenoid face is simply reamed to match the humeral head contour. Following implantation of the glenoid, the humeral osteotomy site is again delivered into the wound for humeral implantation, figure. Care must be taken when delivering the proximal humerus so that, as the arm is externally rotated for access to the medullary canal, the greater tuberosity does not lever on the inserted glenoid component. A bone hook applying lateral traction will minimize the likelihood of this happening. The deltoid is retracted out of the way. The humerus is externally rotated and brought into the wound, and slight hyperextension exposes the proximal humerus and its medullary canal. At this point, the previously inserted brooch, if it has been left in the canal, may be removed. In the comprehensive system, several stem thicknesses and lengths are available, and options exist for varied head sizes. In general, the mini stem length is my preferred length. The diameter utilized corresponds to the final brooch used. One must remember that the final implant adds one and half mm coating to the corresponding size brooch used to prepare the canal figure. Utilizing the final stem inserter, with the version rod set to the desired version, the final implant is inserted. While cement may be used, if necessary, the coated surface of this implant is intended for press fit insertion without cement. Selection of head size is an important intraoperative decision. While heads are available in varied diameters and varied thicknesses, in general, the largest head that will allow closure of the subscapularis around it is selected. Versa dial technology in this system also permits as much as a 5 mm offset to the head through specific implant modularity. Either an offset or a fixed head without offset can be utilized. I decide on the head size both by the size of the head that has been resected originally and by how tight the rotator cuff is after the humeral trial is in place and the shoulder is reduced. In general, a larger head size will allow greater tension in the surrounding soft tissues, and it will potentially permit more power, figure. A smaller head size allows easier closure of the rotator cuff and more play in the glenior humeral joint, and it will avoid overstuffing the joint, figure. With the humeral head reduced, the humerus should be stable in the glenoid yet permit some anterior and posterior translation. In addition, inferior traction should permit the humeral head to translate inferiorly somewhat. The correct position of the humerus is with the top of the humeral head component approximately 3 to 5 mm above the top of the greater tuberosity. Too prominent a greater tuberosity will cause impingement of the tuberosity on the acromion while too proud a head may concentrate pressure on the superior glenoid once the shoulder is relocated, figures. After this final insertion of the humeral component, the shoulder is again reduced. Stability and motion are again tested, figures. It should be recognized that some laxity will be present under regional or general anesthesia, particularly if extensive capsular resection has occurred. Postoperatively, muscle tone quickly assists in stabilizing the implant. If there is frank posterior dislocation intraoperatively, which may occur because of the asymmetric wear of the glenoid, a number of options exist. The larger humeral head may be inserted, thus creating more tension in the capsular tissue. The humeral component may be placed in less retroversion, a difficult option if the humerus has been completely prepared with its brooch system to a specific version. The posterior capsule of the shoulder may be directly tightened to create more soft tissue tension. 
the post-operative course may be altered, either with immobilization in some external rotation or with restriction of post-operative range of motion to avoid the frontal plane. Once the humerus is implanted and the shoulder is reduced, the subscapularis is repaired anatomically to the point of its division, making no attempt to close the anterior or posterior capsule figure. It may be repaired tendon to tendon or through drill holes in the lesser tuberosity. A heavy number 2 non-absorbable suture is used for subscapularis closure. Testing the motion in forward flexion and external rotation provides information on subscapularis tension and implant stability and can guide both the extent and position of the postoperative range of motion. A hemovac is placed deep to the deltoid, exiting through a separate stab wound. The deltopectoral interval is closed with an absorbable suture. Subcutaneous tissue is closed with an absorbable suture and a subcuticular running stitch is made, followed by approximation of the skin with steri strips and the addition of a sterile dressing. Thanks for watching my video. Do not forget to subscribe my non-profit YouTube channel. Thank you.